Hello, my name is Van de Keizer, and you are now watching a video on imaging of malformations of cortical development. What are malformations of cortical development? Well, it's a very broad group of disorders of the cerebral cortex that are the result of any kind of interruption of the process of cortical formation. It's an important group of disorders, especially in the pediatric population. Malformations of cortical development can be found in about 3% of patients with any kind of intellectual disability. And more importantly, they are a frequent finding in patients with pediatric epilepsy. They are found or present in about 25% of patients with pediatric focal epilepsy. They are a very important source of therapy-resistant epilepsy and constitute about 20 to 40% of these cases, and in children who underwent epilepsy surgery, malformations of cortical development were the causative lesion in over 40%. So there's a very important association of cortical malformations with epilepsy, and these are uh, an important group of disorders to know when dealing and evaluating the imaging uh, studies of epileptic patients. So to understand what kind of cortical malformations are out there and why they look the way they do, it's important to have a notion of the process of normal cortical development. Normal cortical development consists of three phases. The first phase is so-called neuronal proliferation. Neuronal proliferation is the development of neurons in the germinal matrix. The germinal matrix is basically the place where neurons develop, grow, proliferate, multiply, and is situated along the primitive lateral ventricles. Now, the cerebral cortex is, is situated in the outermost part of the cerebral hemisphere. So these primitive neurons have to get there. They do that in the second phase, which is migration. To migrate to the developing cortex, these neurons are helped by glial cells, so-called radial glial cells, which have very long processes which extend all the way from the germinal matrix to the developing cortex, and the primitive neurons or the neuronal progenitor cells can basically uh, use them as some kind of um, guide wire to get to the developing cortex. Once our neurons have arrived in the developing cortex, the final stage can happen, which is the phase of neuronal organization. The development of the cerebral cortex in a six-layered structure in which our neurons are also organized radially in columns. So neurons have a columnar organization in the cerebral cortex. Now, it appears a bit as if these stages all happen one after another. That's not the case. These stages overlap for a great extent. So we can have proliferation still occurring while there's also already organization. So uh, they are not separate in time, but overlap. Uh, James Barkovich developed a classification of uh, cortical malformations, uh, which is very useful for us as a neuroradiologist. We have to admit this classification is a simplification. It's not even always correct because the more we learn about these group of disorders, the more we realize that they don't always fit in this scheme as developed by James Barkovich, but I still like it because it's so easy to understand and it gives us such a useful framework to understand these important uh, malformations. So James Barkovich classifies uh, or classified cortical malformations and three groups based upon the stage of development that got interrupted. So we have disorders of neuronal proliferation, disorders of neuronal migration, and disorders of neuronal organization. Let's start with disorders of neuronal proliferation. What happens when something goes wrong here? We can either have not enough proliferation, or 
instead of not enough proliferation, too much apoptosis of the neuronal progenitor cells, which leads to microcephaly. We can have too much proliferation or not enough apoptosis because apoptosis of neuronal progenitor cells is part of this process. Uh, not enough apoptosis leading to megalencephaly or we can have normal proliferation but of abnormal cells. And these abnormal cells then migrate to the developing cortex and there they give rise to so-called focal cortical dysplasias. If all these terms are new for you, don't be scared. We'll walk you through it uh, one entity after another. My apologies for the cough. Let's start with microcephaly. What is microcephaly? Well, basically, microcephaly is not a radiological diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. It literally means small head. So somebody with a microcephaly has a small head. This will be normally mentioned on your radiological request form. Reason for the exam, microcephaly. So it's a clinical diagnosis. It's defined as a head circumference that is two or three standard deviations below the norm. So two is mostly used for uh, fetuses and three for um, neonates, eh, babies. Uh, they are the most common kind of cortical malformation in patients with developmental delay. A microcephaly can be present at birth or can also develop postnatally. And it's not a final diagnosis. As said, microcephaly is basically just a clinical description. Somebody has a small head, and because the head is small, the brain will probably be small as well, but it can have a wide variety of causes. These can be primary, so it can be the result of a chromosomal um, defect, a chromosomal abnormality, or a very specific uh, genetic mutation, or it can be secondary, acquired, and an important cause of acquired uh, microcephaly would be a perinatal hypoxic ischemic insult leading to diffuse cerebral atrophy or congenital uh, cytomegalovirus infection. Um, what is our task as radiologists? Well, basically, it's not to diagnose microcephaly. The patients already have this diagnosis. It's basically examine the images to see if we can discover a cause. See if the patient has suffered some kind of insult. See if there are specific abnormalities that point away to a congenital cytomegalovirus infection or another torch infection or not. If the microcephaly is purely genetic, and in a lot of cases, no real genetic cause is found, but let's assume, then no abnormalities will be seen, and no um, large structural defects, uh, white matter looks normal, no other abnormalities. Um, and then the question is, so this is the MRI of a girl, 20 weeks old, with microcephaly. The question is, is this a normal brain or not? And the first time you see a case like this, it can be a bit difficult because your gut feeling might tell you that this brain doesn't look normal, but I don't see defects. I have no arguments for a congenital infection. I don't see any structural abnormality. So why does this brain look so peculiar to me? When you have that feeling, always compare with another patient about the same age. This is another girl, even a bit younger, 16 weeks old, who had no microcephaly, received an MRI for a totally different reason. And then you see there's a clear differences. There's a clear difference in the appearance of these two brains. But how to describe it? How would you describe what we see here? Let's look a bit in more detail. Let's look at these T1-weighted inversion recovery images. Here, there's a magnification, and this is the magnification of the T1-weighted images of a normal child. Now, let's look at the gyri and the sulci. What do we see if we compare those? We see less sulci in a child or in the child with microcephaly, and it also 
they appear to be a bit less deep. So we have or we see what is called a simplified chiral pattern. We see a less soci compared to a normal child. And this is something that is most often most pronounced in the frontal lobes. But apart from that, the cortex is perfectly normal. There's a normal cortical thickness and a normal distinction between the gray and the white matter. Here is another example. And this is, I believe, a bit more pronounced of a child with microcephaly. And these sagittal images clearly show how small the brain really is when you compare it to the brainstem and the cerebellum, which are normal in this patient. So just the cerebral hemispheres are extremely small. When there are no arguments for an underlying uh, structural cause, um, this is most likely a primary microcephaly, a genetic microcephaly. And when you see this appearance, it is sometimes referred to as a microcephaly with a simplified gyral pattern. Now, this simplified gyral pattern is not always present. It's a spectrum. So in this first patient, we clearly see less sulci. It's a simplified pattern. This is a bit less pronounced in this second child here and still even less pronounced in this child. So all these children had a microcephaly, but we see that there is a wide variability in the degree of chiral simplification. So, uh, oh yeah, and something that I often notice is that children who have a microcephaly with a simplified gyral pattern often have a bit of a triangular skull shape uh, anteriorly. Uh, we can also see it here a little bit, but it's most pronounced in this patient here. So let's move on. So that was microcephaly. Let's move on to our second group of disorders, megalencephaly. Well, megalencephaly is basically not a correct term because I've never seen a brain that was diffusely enlarged. It's basically, the correct term should be hemimegalencephaly. A hemimegalencephaly is a very rare disorder in which one hemisphere is significantly enlarged and dysplastic, abnormal. The reason for this is unknown. It's still a cryptogenic disorder. Hemimegalencephaly can be an isolated finding, but it can also be associated with several cutaneous overgrowth syndrome, such as Proteus syndrome, or a Clippeltrenone syndrome, just to name two of them. Clinically, these children can have uh, intellectual disabilities, they can have um, paraparesis uh, or spastic plegia, and they can also have and most often have severe refractory epilepsy. Uh, let's look at the images of this patient. It's a very rare disorder. I believe there are about 250 reported cases in the literature, and this is the only case I've seen in my still young career as a neuroradiologist. And what do we see? These are T1-weighted images, these are T2-weighted images. Well, the first thing you might ask, the first time you see this on imaging is, yeah, what side is abnormal? Could it be that the right cerebral hemisphere is actually atrophic, and that, that is the pathological side, or is it truly the left hemisphere that is enlarged? Well, if we magnify this a bit, we have to say that the left hemisphere is abnormal. Look at the cortex. We will discuss this uh, later in a bit more detail, but this is an imaging finding that fits the diagnosis polymicrogyri, so the cortex is abnormal, and we also have extensive white matter abnormalities, as you can see here. When we look at uh, on these coronal imaging, we see some, it's not uh, very extensive, but we see some dilatation of the ipsilateral lateral ventricle, as well as some uh, skull thickening uh, on the involved side. 
So to summarize, what are the imaging findings of a hemimegalencephaly? We have a unilateral cerebral overgrowth. We have one hemisphere that appears larger than the other. And the cortex is diffusely abnormal. It looks thickened. It looks a bit like polymicrogyri. The signal intensity of the underlying white matter is abnormal. And the patients can have some skull thickening uh, on the involved side or some asymmetric ventricular enlargement on the involved side. So it's a rare disorder. So uh, if you ever see one, please let me know. I love seeing uh, interesting cases. So let's move on to the next group of disorders, and it's a group, the focal cortical dysplasias, a very important group. And this is, I believe, a uh, archetypical case. We see here an area of subcortical signal abnormalities on both flare and the two-weighted images, which extend all the way to the cortex. And then we see some extension of these signal abnormalities towards the left lateral ventricle. Especially this latter finding is very suggestive for a focal cortical dysplasia. Now, what are these? What are focal cortical dysplasias? There isn't just one, hmm? for starters. Everything has to be complicated. It's basically a group of disorders. And this group of disorders is characterized by the presence, pathologically, of a disturbance of the normal cortical architecture. As I said, a normal cortex has six layers and has a radial columnar organization of the neurons in these six layers. In patients with focal cortical dysplasia, this is interrupted. Now, you have two types. And that is already simplifying a bit, but let's say you have two types. You have a focal cortical dysplasia type one, in which the architecture of the cortex is abnormal, but the cells in the cortex, those are normal. And then you have focal cortical dysplasia type two. You have a disturbed cortical architecture, but on top of that, you have abnormal cells situated in this abnormally organized cortex. Uh, what we are talking about here is focal cortical dysplasia type 2, to be more specific, type 2B. That is a disorder of neuronal proliferation because we have abnormal cells. We had proliferation of abnormal cells that then migrated to the cortex. Focal cortical dysplasia type 1 and type 2A are actually disorders of cortical organization, and we will discuss those later. So just keep in mind, everything I'm telling you now is about focal cortical dysplasia type 2B. And this is a nice illustration I found in an article on focal cortical dysplasia published in Lancet Neurology. And this is the architecture of the neuronal cortex, or of the normal cortex rather, and we see that it is organized in six layers. We see or can appreciate a radial organization in columns, and uh, we see that this is lacking in focal cortical dysplasia. We have no layers, or we can no longer distinguish the six layers of the neocortex, and the neurons are oriented quite arbitrarily. There is no radial organization in columns of the cortex. Furthermore, we're talking about focal cortical dysplasia type 2b, so we have abnormal neurons, dysmorphic neurons, and these are, for the pathologist, uh, pathognomonic for focal cortical dysplasia type 2b, so-called balloon cells. So that is what the pathologist sees. What do we see? And why do we have to see it? Why do we have to scrutinize our images for focal cortical dysplasia and epileptic patients? Because focal cortical dysplasia is the most important cause of focal therapy-resistant epilepsy in children. It is found in about half of children who underwent epilepsy surgery and about 20% of adults. Um, and problem is that despite the fact that they are quite uh, important, they can be very subtle. 
In this case, we see here a linear area of increased signal intensity on these flare images. And if we follow that, we see here some focal thickening of the cerebral cortex. This is a so-called transmental sign. And this is not really part of the dysplasia. Uh, a focal cortical dysplasia is basically a group of abnormal neurons that's migrated towards the cortex. And then when they get here, we get a focal cortical dysplasia. And the transmental sign, this thin line, is basically some sort of scar tissue along the migratory migratory part that these abnormal neurons talk, took in the brain parenchyma. So if we follow the transmental sign, we land on the actual focal cortical dysplasia. And if we magnify it a bit, what do we see? We see, here we see the transmental sign, so the radial scar. And uh, then we land on the focal cortical dysplasia and we see some focal cortical thickening. It is often, but not always, but often at the bottom of a deep sulcus. There can be some blurring of the gray-white matter interface, although in this case, that's not really the case here. And there can also be some discrete subcortical T2 signal increase, but we don't really see that in this case here either. And then lastly, the transmental sign, which is present in about half of type 2B focal cortical dysplasias. Here is another case, and we see a very nice transmental sign extending from an area of subcortical signal abnormalities towards uh, the lateral ventricle. Um, why is a transmental sign also important? Because it could, it can sometimes be difficult to differentiate these subcortical signal abnormalities from low-grade glial tumors, for instance. If you see a transmental sign, that makes focal cortical dysplasia the most likely diagnosis. Furthermore, looking for a transmental sign is important because these abnormalities can be very subtle. And thanks to the transmental sign, we can sometimes pick them up easier. Who would have seen this as easy as we do now if it hadn't been for this transmental sign. So look for the transmental sign to pick up a focal cortical dysplasia. However, unfortunately, they are not always present, only in about 45% of cases, so a bit less than a half. Um, my apologies. And this is a case uh, that is very, very subtle in which there is no transmental sign to help us. And does anyone see the focal cortical dysplasia? It's subtle. You can see it, but it's subtle. Uh, these are flare images. These are T2 images. And these are uh, try the MPRH T1 images. Now, let's start with windowing or flare images. And if we, we, if we do that, something happens. Suddenly, we see an area of cortical or subcortical signal increase that was not very easy to see or not really detectable on the unwindowed images. And if we now re-examine our T2-weighted images and our T1-weighted images in the area of signal increase, we suddenly see on the T2-weighted images some blurring of the gray-white matter junction, and we can't really distinguish or separate the cortex from the uh, T2 signal increase and the subcortical white matter. And if we re-examine our, our T1-weighted images, we now see some very subtle subcortical signal abnormalities. So in conclusion, we have to window. Unwindowed, we can detect it now because we know it's there, but it's a lot easier to see this subtle signal increase on windowed flare images located in the cingulite gyrus on the right side. And once we know it's there, we can also detect the lesion on T2 weighted images and try the MPRH T1 weighted images. Uh, so what does this case learn? What do we learn from this case? When you do an MRI in children with refractory epilepsy, 
focal cortical dysplasias have to be looked for, but they can be very subtle. So you need a high quality MRI exam, preferably a dry Tesla MRI with uh, 3D flare images, 3D MPRA, MPRH images, and you have to look hard and the 3D flare images, you have to window them hard. So that brings us to disorders of neuronal migration. There are once again three uh, disorders within this group. We have disorders that are associated with decreased or less neuronal migration. And uh, we're going to talk about lysencephaly. There are disorders in which neuronal migration has actually increased. The neurons uh, migrate beyond the limits of the cortical plate. And uh, these group of disorders are called cobblestone malformations. I will not talk about those. Why not? Well, I'm only showing cases I've seen myself in my daily radiological practice as a neuroradiologist, and I've never encountered the case, unfortunately. So I'm not showing you those. Um, I can tell you that they look a lot like polymicrogyri. And very often there is a suggestive clinical context because these are seen in patients with congenital muscular dystrophies. So these patients often are already known with uh, syndromic diseases such as muscle A brain disease, Fukuyama, muscular dystrophy, uh, Walker-Warburg syndrome, and so on. Lastly, so I'm not going to talk about them, sorry about that. And lastly, we have disorders in which neuronal migration is abnormal, and we get islands of neurons that are located on unusual, strange places, and these are called the gray matter heterotopias. Let's start with lysencephaly. This is the old mini radiological appearance of a lysencephaly. We see here almost, and this uh, child, almost no sulcation whatsoever, and the brain has a figure of eight or an hourglass shape, both on the axial and on the coronal images. So what are the radiological hallmarks of a lysencephaly? You basically have two. That is, the cortical surface is smooth. You have no sulcation or minimal sulcation. And secondly, you have a very thick cortex. And why is that? Because this cortex consists of a whole bunch of neurons that didn't make it to their final destination. So this is just a very broad band of arrested neurons. So these two are the imaging findings of a lysencephaly. And this gives rise, as I said, to the so-called hourglass or figure of eight shape. Here we see a primitive uh, Sylvian fissure, but it is very shallow, very undeep. And uh, then we have here the thick cortex as set, which can be up to two centimeters thick. White matter is very limited. So we see here the T2 hyperintense signal of the white matter, and these patients often have uh, some ventriculomegaly. So let's examine the cortex in a bit more detail. Pathologically, the cortex in a patient with lysencephaly consists of four layers, and we can distinguish three of those on MRI images. Let's magnify these images. What do we have? We first have this very broad band of arrested cells, yeah, this thick inner band. Then we have a T2 hyperintense rim. It is hyperintense because in this rim, there are basically or practically almost no cells present. So there is a lot of uh, space for some interstitial fluid there, uh, increasing the signal on T2. And lastly, we have a thin outer cortical layer. So we can basically distinguish three layers in the very thick cortex of the lysencephalic brain. Then, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the difference between lysencephaly and agyra and 
Akijaira. I'm pretty sure you've heard those terms, and they are often used as synonyms for one another. You know, an Akijaira, Akijaira, Lysencephaly. I refrain from using the terms Agira and Pachygira. And why is that? Because these are just descriptive terms. Literally, Agira means patient has no gyri, and Pachygira means patient has a few gyri, and then you have something in between, Agira, Pachygira. This is just descriptive. And in my experience, they are often used for uh, patients who have other disorders than lysencephaly. So I prefer to use lysencephaly, and I use it in patients who have limited sulcation, so an appearance which you might refer to as agyri or pachygyri, combined with a very thick cerebral cortex, which is imperative for the radiological suggestion of lysencephaly. Lysencephaly literally means, by the way, smooth brain. Um, lysencephaly is a genetic disorder. The last time I checked, but it's been a while, there were at least 17 genes identified that can give rise to the appearance of a lysencephaly. And pathologically, what is a lysencephaly? Well, basically, neurons can't reach their final destination. Uh, so migration is arrested somewhere between the germinal matrix and the developing cortex. And uh, the most, and why is it a genetic disorder? Because we need a lot of genes, because we need this apparatus. We need the radial glial cells, but we also need a functioning neuroskeleton or cytoskeleton in the uh, neuronal progenitor cells, because they need that to be able to migrate along these processes to the developing cortex. So as soon as you have any kind of genetic defect and either these radial glial cells or in the cytoskeleton of the neuronal progenitor cells, migration is disrupted and cannot occur normally. So the best known mutation is the so-called LIS-1 deletion, which gives rise to the so-called Miller-Dicker syndrome. And a second mutation, which I think is good to know or to be um, know that it exists, is a so-called double Gorton mutation. Uh, the DCX mutation, DCX is a gene found on the X chromosome. So when you have a mutation in that gene, in boys, you will get a classical lysencephaly. If you have it in girls, and it's only on one X uh, chromosome, you will get a form of mild lysencephaly, a so-called double band heterotopia. Let's show you what that is exactly. So this is a young girl with epilepsy. And if you look at these the two-weighted images, we see here an area that is slightly hyperintense, yeah? And what to make of that? Let's zoom in a little bit, but still we're not any wiser. What is that exactly? What to make of that? Let's also examine these 3D MPUR HD one-weighted images. And now we see that we have kind of a, a band of T1 hypointense signal that runs almost parallel to the cerebral cortex, and the signal is a bit similar to that of the cerebral cortex. This, and we can also appreciate it here on these coronal uh, reformats, what we are looking at here is basically a rim of arrested neurons. So it's a kind of lysencephaly, but just not as extreme as in the classical lysencephaly. We almost only see that in women, and as I told you, the majority have mutations in the DCX gene. Uh, clinically, it is associated with refractory epilepsy. So this is a so-called band heterotopia. There, we can, yeah, you can argue about it. Should we see that as a disorder of decreased migration, so an incomplete migration or a mild form of encephaly, or is it actually a gray matter heterotopia, the presence of neurons in an abnormal location? It's a matter of semantics, if you ask me, but this gives us a good 
transition to the next topic, which is gray matter heterotopias. But I am going to close this session for now because it's already been a pretty extensive one. And I'm going to upload the second video shortly after. I hope you found this interesting. If you found this interesting, please continue with the second video. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, just leave a message in the comment section.